All righty. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here in person and anybody who's online. Um, we're really glad to reconvene for this semester here uh, at the Center for Asian Democracy at the University of Louisville. Uh, my name is uh, Professor David Buckley. I'm the Paul Weber Endowed Chair of Politics, Science, and Religion here in the department, uh, where I also direct the Center for Asian Democracy. Um, this is our first uh, event in 2024. Uh, thanks for coming out during this very cold week. Hopefully we'll have some slightly more pleasant conditions for our future events. Um, you'll find more announcements about those on social media feeds. We'll email them around. You'll see flyers for those who are on campus. Uh, the most immediate upcoming one will be on February 5th, which is a Monday. We have Professor Robert Hefner from uh, Boston University joining us uh, to talk about his most recent book on Islam and Indonesian democracy, um, and with particular focus on the upcoming election in Indonesia, um, the world's largest Muslim majority democracy, which will take place um, in mid-February. So it's perfect timing for Professor Hefner to come, and we're mm -hmm. honored to have him visit. He's one of the world's most distinguished scholars of political Islam in Indonesia. Um, but today, our focus is elsewhere in Southeast Asia. Uh, we're really glad to have Professor Jacques Bertrand join us uh, from the University of Toronto uh, to discuss civil war and political institutions in uh, Myanmar, um, and also in comparative perspective. I'll keep this short because I know that we have a window here and some people will have to leave for classes also that begin at one. If that describes you, um, this is a decently flexible room, so feel free to kind of quietly make your way out the back. We understand. Uh, please exit through the back and not through the front, just so that uh, the stream doesn't get interrupted. Uh, professor Jacques Bertrand is Professor of Political Science at the University of Toronto, as well as Director of the Collaborative Master Specialization in Contemporary East and Southeast Asian Studies um, uh, at uh, Toronto and at the Monk School for Global and Public Affairs there. Um, he's the founding director of the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at the Asian Institute and also co-founder of the Post-Core Lab, uh, a research lab at the University of Toronto that focuses on post-conflict dynamics, um, not just in Myanmar, but more broadly across the region, um, which is one reason why we're going to hear about comparative perspectives on the conflict today. Uh, Professor Bertrand has worked for uh, decades on questions of ethnicity, nationalism, democracy, and conflict in the region. Um, uh, his most recent book, which we'll hear some from today, um, uh, is entitled Winning by Process, the State and Neutralization of Ethnic Minorities in Myanmar. Um, and uh, But he's also published uh, even more books than I knew about, actually. <laughs> I'd like to look at your CV. Um, related to the relationship between nationalism, democracy, and conflict across the region, um, Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, and other cases as well. So we're very fortunate to have him with us here today, and really glad you made the trip in this uh, in this wintry time of year. Thanks very much, Jack. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much, David. This very kind introduction, and um, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Louisville. My first time here. I've been uh, appreciating. Uh, the university, the, the, the city, uh, to getting to learn a little bit more about, about, um, about your environment here. But one of the points I did not expect is that it would be as cold as in Toronto. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so I'm still enjoying it. So thanks for coming out. And, uh, and what I thought I would do so uh, for, the, for today, um, because uh, as was just mentioned, I did publish a book uh, that was reflecting on the 10 years of semi-democracy in Myanmar and looking at particularly the attempts to uh, address issues of civil war uh, over those 10 years. So it was taking a look back at that decade. Uh, we were fortunately doing research not knowing that there was going to be a coup in February 2021 that would end all of this, but the book was finished afterwards and we could reflect on it. However, um, one of the uh, questions or, or, or challenges perhaps we could see that David uh, uh, asked me to think about was, well, what does the current context uh, say about, um, about what you've written about? And I wrote another book on democracy and secessionism uh, in, in the region more comparatively. So what I thought I would do is to draw on some of these books. I'm not going to be presenting the arguments of those books. I want to draw some insights from those books to think about and reflect about the current situation in Myanmar and what it means. So I'm doing something that political scientists, scientists don't do very often, which is sort of gaze into the future rather than the past and see um, and, and see where some of my insights uh, might lead. So I'm calling this political paths out of the civil war, um, uh, Myanmar in comparative perspective, and let's see uh, where this leads us. So I think most, most of you know uh, that Myanmar has had since February 2021 an intensification of its civil war. 
Uh, it has been, um, <clears throat> and I could throw out a few numbers, 40,000 uh, people have died as a result of this sort of resurgence. There was a massive civil disobedience movement in the first few months after the coup in 2021, attempting to resist the, the military's uh, taking, uh, taking over of the, um, uh, complete taking over of the government after 10 years of semi-democracy. Uh, there were organizations of people's defense forces, which were essentially um, uh, mostly the majority uh, people who left the cities to fight in the countryside, uh, armed themselves against uh, the military junta. So uh, this has been a very uh, intense two years. Uh, 1.3 million people at least have been displaced, and this is on top of more than a million people who have been displaced before. So it's we can talk about a very large-scale civil war that has been ongoing uh, in Myanmar in the last couple of years. The current headlines in the newspapers have displaced the civil war, but just reminding that it's certainly uh, continuing to this day, and particularly uh, in the last few months, there's been even more intensification along the Chinese border. Uh, so if we look at clashes, and I could run through where the most of the clashes are uh, have uh, occurred um, over the last two years, but this is sort of a, just a cumulative uh, map of where the clashes have occurred. And what you want to notice is that it is cl they are clustered in many ways, which is uh, interesting and significant as well. So this is a large-scale movement. Uh, against the military more broadly, but the reality of it is that most of the clashes are occurring over here. Uh, and the only thing I want you to note, because I'm going to speak to it, speak to it, <laughs> I have to not disappear online as well, uh, is that uh, the areas that I'm going to talk about that are ethnic minority areas tend to all be the highlands and, and the sort of periphery of uh, parts of Myanmar. So you get here along the Thai border. So I talked about some groups that are along the Thai border. When I'm talking about a number of groups along the Chinese border, uh, whether it's, uh, uh, there, there are a number of, so the, the Shan are along the, the border here, a couple of armed groups. There are the Chin that are up here. Uh, the Chin are on this part of, uh, of, the, of the border. The Rakhine are, are over here. This area here is actually uh, a majority, uh, it's, is, is mainly populated by the Bama majority, uh, and yet this is where most of the clashes have occurred. Now, I'm, I'm simply going to say something about this later, so I wanted to flag this, but also give you an occasion to see visually what it means uh, to have had these uh, ethnic armed groups that have dominated all these areas, or at least where the, the Civil War has been for the longest time, and now what this new phase in the Civil War represents, which is when I'm talking about the People's, De uh, People's Defense Forces, the PDFs, it, they are organized uh, mostly in the lowlands and the Loma majority uh, areas. So all this to say, um, and I know for those of you who don't have uh, a lot of background on Myanmar, it gets easily complex and difficult uh, because there's a lot of armed groups and that has been a uh, very long civil war. So I just want to say a few words of background there simply to put this into context before I get to the main points uh, that I wanted to, uh, to, to talk about today. Uh, so the backdrop of this is that uh, these, this recent set of uh, phase in the civil war since 2021 uh, is against the backdrop of a semi-democratic uh, government from uh, essentially uh, all the uh, the, the previous 10 years from 2011 to uh, 2021. So during that period, it's not that the uh, military had uh, exited government, so it's a bit uh, odd to talk about a coup uh, in February 2021 because the military was still in control. It was a, basically a state with uh, a civilian side and the military having its own autonomy, uh, a very complex kind of arrangement, but uh, essentially an attempt here uh, on the part of the military was driven by the military, uh, the opening in 2011, in order to have uh, to test out a pathway towards uh, civilian rule, which uh, it was attempting to control. And when it lost control over um, its objectives, it then simply stepped back in uh, in 2021. But there was something significant in many, many ways uh, in Myanmar during this time period 
I think it would be a gross overgeneralization to say that it was predictable that the military step back in and get rid of that, that democratic experiment. So um, anyway, so, that's a, so simply to say it's happening against the backdrop of those 10 years, which I'm going to speak to in a moment. Uh, and also remembering that it has been a military-dominated state basically since the 1950s. So that, that the uh, Tatmadaw, the military, has been uh, essentially controlling, was overwhelmingly controlling Myanmar up until 2011, attempted the shared power uh, from 2011 to 2021, and then uh, since 2021 is attempting to reestablish that complete dominance. Uh, what I want to so the flag is that in a way when we talk about a resurgence of civil war that's really what it is but it's also a new dimension of civil war uh, in the last two years uh, it's keeping in mind that the current phase is really uh, has additional elements to it here's my pink it's up here. <clears throat> so uh, the current phase is uh, we in some ways is to see that there are additional elements added to what was existing as a 60-year civil war so the current phase of, uh, if you've been reading on the People's Defense Forces, PDFs, or the civil disobedience movement, they are the two basically um, large uh, manifestations of what has been happening since 2021 that is different, which involves essentially the, the Bama majority. So the majority ethnic group, the Bama, more than 60% of the population, uh, they were not they were not involved in the 60 years of civil war for the most part as the military against ethnic uh, armed organizations. Uh, now there's a large scale of young, uh, mostly young uh, Bama who have joined forces in attempting to topple the uh, military, and they have expressed this through uh, a lot, this large civil disobedience movement as well as organizing these uh, people's defense forces, which are essentially small militias across the country attempting to uh, obtain arms and simply organize themselves in a coordinated manner uh, uh, against the um, against the, uh, the top level. Now, I should say, and I should have added here, there's also the National Unity Government. This was simply looking at the uh, organized resistance, but the National Unity Government, which was formed out of the um, previous semi-democratic government that won the election uh, in 2021 before being uh, ousted and attempted to reorganize a government uh, uh, outside uh, a government in exile um, and um, and so they are attempting to coordinate and lead uh, some of this uh, somewhat uh, mixed in terms of its results mm -hmm. I'll come back to that so remembering then that this civil war this is a new phase but one cannot um, understand where this can go without understanding that this civil war has been going on for 60 years and has been a very different kind of civil war in some ways. This was a civil war involving ethnic armed organizations uh, that were attempting in, uh, to uh, not only oppose the uh, government of Myanmar, but wanted to carve out independent states for ethnic minority groups in those regions that I was outlining before. That objective is remains. The ethnic armed organizations are still, uh, in some ways, attempting to um, have either high degrees of autonomy, federalism, or even their independent states. Uh, and so they, it makes this civil war particularly complex because we now have multi-layered uh, objectives that are in, in form. So, if we think through what are the potential pathways here, like I said, there's been an escalation in the last two years. Those of you who are up on recent news will know that since October, there's been uh, a particular operation involving three um, ethnic armed organizations, which is called the Brotherhood Alliance. Uh, and those three armed organizations have made some significant inroads in the north of, uh, of uh, Myanmar. Uh, and so there's a sense that there's a tipping uh, in favor of some of the resistance. Uh, and so uh, the discourse around uh, what is happening and how it's unfolding is to suggest that there can be in this, um, uh, these dimensions here with the People's Defense Forces, the National Unity Government I just mentioned, ethnic armed organizations, and the Tatmadaw, the military, that there can be a change occurring and maybe uh, one of these uh, forces will uh, basically fail. So let's uh, see what would happen if 
the Tatmadaw was suddenly uh, going to uh, be out of the picture. And as a result, of course, if the military was toppled or at least significantly weakened, and the NUG, the National Unity Government, were to emerge alongside ethnic armed organizations, the People's Defense Forces would be a, a force that one would no longer have to contend with as well. They would likely fold uh, into what would be behind this new government. So I want to entertain for the rest or most of the rest of this, um, this uh, presentation, uh, this uh, call it a fantasy, <laughs> imaginary possibility, a scenario, maybe some, some will say a hopeful outcome. This is the outcome that basically most people in the resistance hope are going to happen imminently in the next few months, which is what would happen if a national unity government, uh, the NUG and the ethnic armed organizations were to emerge out of the current conflict. So if there's an NUG EAO victory, what then? Um, that they are currently working on and have uh, come up with a draft constitution based on federal democracy, which was seen as a very key concept for resolving civil war and moving towards a new democratic framework. Uh, federal democracy, and it's very important to, uh, to, um, to note that uh, for those involved, particularly on the ethnic armed organization side, having the word federal before democracy was key because it meant reinforcing the fact that the basic principle would be federalism before democratic, uh, meaning that then it would entrench in their minds a much more clear division between uh, states that would be representing ethnic minority groups and then uh, a certain configuration of regions or states that would then be dominated by uh, Bama majority groups in a kind of federated arrangement. However, there are some considerations that would need to be taken into account, some of which I, I can maybe address in the, in the uh, <clears throat> Q&A later on. Uh, but the three considerations would be, uh, say we, the, there is a sudden victory, that the military does collapse in a few months, and then they start off with this um, draft constitution, uh, there will be a couple of very thorny questions that will emerge quite immediately. The one I can't, I don't have much time to talk about now, but I can talk later, is the military. Um, what to do with the military if they defeat the military, you still can't get rid of the military. The military is key in any transition towards a democratic, uh, democratic uh, future. Uh, that leaves us with the EAOs. The ethnic armed organizations, if they do win this civil war, are, first of all, they've been armed for many years. Some are very powerful. Some have become even more powerful than they've ever been. Uh, they need to agree on a political settlement amongst themselves. Uh, that division is not obvious because at the moment they are very, very divided over their objectives. They're very divided in terms of the types of organizations they are. And so that will immediately become an important consideration if there is any kind of victory. And the third is can the uh, historical mistrust, I said it's important to think about the different phases, the, um, the current phase really uh, there is a lot of enthusiasm to remove the military, but this 60 years of civil war means that uh, over repeated uh, decades, the ethnic armed organizations have become, uh, or ethnic minorities more generally, not the ethnic armed arm, arm organizations, but the ethnic minorities continue to mistrust very much the, the, the uh, willingness of the majority or of the state to, um, to come to terms or come to some uh, political settlement uh, with ethnic minorities. So this will jump, will become the uh, very specific uh, and, and, and clear uh, imperative, should there be this, uh, a very optimistic scenario that uh, the NUG and many, uh, many uh, supporters are hoping will happen in the next little while. So what I wanted to do analytically here uh, in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes is to think about uh, what can I say about, on the basis of the kinds of things that I've been looking at in my two books here, uh, to uh, inform what are some of the considerations that could be taken into account if that scenario were to uh, uh, happen. So I want to organize this as temporal and regional comparisons. Temporal thinking through what are some, a few of the lessons that we can think about in that decade of semi-democracy that I mentioned. Uh, in that will come back to basically inform 
what would be any future negotiation and reorganization of the Myanmar state. And then secondly, secondly uh, without getting into too much detail, uh, but making some comparisons here to two cases where there have been successful resolution of civil war, transitions away from armed groups to civilian organizations in the region, uh, which is in the case of Achenis in Indonesia and Moros in the Philippines, which is an ongoing process at the moment. So thinking through this period of semi-democracy uh, and ethnic nationalities, uh, and again, reminding you that from 2011 to 2021 was, as I said, a period of uh, semi-democracy where the, the, the uh, military had transitioned to um, a, um, <clears throat> a um, civilian government. Uh, it was an, a civilian um, officers in, in, had, uh, were in control uh, of the civilian government for the first phase and then 2015 onwards was after an election, the um, National League for Democracy under Aung San Suu Kyi's leadership was the civilian side of the government from 2015 until 2021. Um, and there were, uh, during this particular period, one has to remember, of course, that the there was a constant pull between the civilian side and the military in terms of carving division of labor in terms of governance in the country, some of which had to do with controlling, for instance, border areas and who was uh, controlling certain ministries. But for the most part, we could think about it as a productive period of semi-democracy semi because there were some key uh, changes for uh, ethnic nationalities or ethnic minority groups. One is that the first is that even though the what we call the 2008 constitution uh, which was drafted essentially by the military uh, and ended up being the constitution that was in place for that period of 10 years uh, the 2008 constitution uh, was the framework uh, in which uh, negotiations and governance were was uh, in, was being implemented in ethnic minority areas and in Myanmar generally for those 10 years now, interestingly, the 2008 constitution initially was highly opposed by many ethnic minority groups, but particularly Aung San Suu Kyi and the National League for Democracy, but they came to work within it and accept that the changes that were going to occur were going to be part of this constitution. Now, what happened during this period, to make a really long story to very, very short, uh, one is that there was a, a certain degree of decentralization that occurred. And that's important in some ways because anything uh, as a starting point that is talking about federalism, which was ethnic minority groups, this is what they want, the top of their objective is a form of federalism. Well, the first step is at least decentralization is a step in that direction. Now, the 2008 constitution remained a, highly, a, a, a fairly um, not a federal uh, uh, constitution by any means. Uh, but it had elements of decentralization and it created certain forms of governance for ethnic minority groups uh, that um, was they were very enthusiastic about in uh, ethnic states. So for those of you who don't have background on Myanmar, just uh, um, emphasizing the point that from the beginning, there's never really been an objection in Myanmar of having ethnic states or so states that are um, identified as being the states for particular ethnic groups, uh, and then there are uh, Bama majority regions. However, it, the, the devil's in the detail as to how much they ever had any power to govern themselves as ethnic states. The 2008 constitution went some, in some direction uh, in giving some powers to what were newly formed local parliaments and, uh, and new forms of, of government in ethnic states. So in some ways, that was a key change. A second key change was that the government, uh, and this was a civilian government that was the, the military, um, milita military uh, uh, civilian party, if you like, uh, that was uh, the USDP that was, um, that brokered the, what was a nationwide ceasefire agreement in 2015. This was an important step because it was the first time there was an extensive ceasefire with promise of political dialogue that ended up um, leading to discussions regarding um, the future uh, 
division of power or, or reorganization of the Myanmar state, which led to this third phase of political dialogue, 20th and first century Panglong Conference, which was supposed to be a very <clears throat> extensive set of discussions, mostly under the, the, the elected uh, government of Aung San Suu Kyi, to discuss various aspects of how to reform the constitution, how to reform the Myanmar state. Um, with hindsight, many people are critical of this, including myself and my co-authors in our book. Uh, however, uh, I do think that in the end, uh, it, it's only with hindsight that we can, we can just discard the process. What, it, there is no doubt in my mind that the democratic framework did allow for credible negotiations. This was the first time that there was at least a framework or a, 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 a period in which democracy, or at least a, a, pre, a, a fairly uh, significant democratic opening, was changing the dynamic of a relationship between ethnic minorities and, and the Myanmar state. So in my sense, that what was important is that it did uh, allow for credible negotiations. What we have starting in 2011 is transition to a quasi-civilian rule under, like I said, Tain Sein and USDP, that made a lot of very significant openings at the beginnings about what they were willing to agree to, including using words such as federalism. Uh, and in Aung San Suu Kyi's government was seen as a, as a new period where uh, some uh, inroads uh, could be made. So I think it would be too quick to conclude that there was never any chance that this kind of environment was going to allow a, a fruitful discussion about, um, about uh, changes in the divisions of power, of representation, uh, and uh, how to include ethnic minorities more significantly in to the Myanmar state. But there were so, it was so complex because it was also about removing the military from power, uh, pathways to get uh, less involvement of the military, that a lot of these different agendas uh, became, uh, became, in a sense, in contradiction to one another and, uh, and, and um, uh, anyways, I'll get, I'll get back to some of that in a second. So democracy did help create a more credible environment and better representation. Ethnic minorities had more representation, more diluted representation. This, can, this is also key because right now the situation is that ethnic armed groups are the ones who monopolize representation of ethnic minorities again, which was the case before. What this decade of semi-democracy, this month, semi-democracy did was open up who could represent ethnic minorities. So you had ethnic political parties, you had, party, you had ethnic minorities who were part of the large national parties and they were claiming representation and justifiably so, civil society organizations. This was not something the ethnic armed groups expected. They, they thought they would maintain their monopoly of representations. They were seeing themselves uh, diluted in their representation. And this is something to think about, uh, about how, you know, when they step back into negotiations with my have. So democracy helped create a credible environment, but it also enabled the state to manipulate, undermine, and neutralize. That's the main argument of the, the book that we both wrote on winning by process. Now, how did this happen in a nutshell? So the credible environment is that formal negotiations had rules to them. They were very clear. Uh, there was uh, a, 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 a certainly the first time that the, the both sides agreed to something as extensive. Like I said, there were state parliaments, participation in new legislation, a very serious and significant effort at drafting uh, legislation uh, that was um, really progressive for, uh, minor for states uh, everywhere in Myanmar. So not only the ethnic minority states, but also the Burma, Burma regions. Ethnic political parties could organize. There was a lot of vibrancy in this respect diversification of representation away from dominance of armed groups. So I think we don't, we shouldn't be discarding that. But in the end, part of the, part of this lessons of this decade is to think about the fact that much of what happened during this time period also led to manipulation and neutralization. So now when we take a step back and we think about those 10 years, despite the fact that there was a lot of possibility in place, the net result is that uh, there was uh, a, uh, when, we, when we take stock of, of, of that decade, that the Myanmar state, and here I'm being very careful about how I'm saying this, but the Myanmar state, and I, and I uh, assume here to be not only the military in its interest, but also uh, the civilian side, uh, had an idea 
that uh, they did not, they agreed generally, they didn't like the idea that ethnic minority states would become highly autonomous in a kind of genuinely federated arrangement. There's always been a kind of tendency to favor a unitary, much more unitary state, one that would be much more uh, centralized. So much of what happened during this decade uh, was a lot of strategies to control negotiation committees, stall on certain on, on discussing real substantive issues, retain centralized powers in the state. And in fact, many, many details of, of governance were remain remain very, very centralized. Uh, the, the constitution and the way it was implemented incentivized dividing ethnic groups. Some of the results we're seeing today, the multiplication of some of the uh, armed groups that are there uh, in, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the sort of post-2021 uh, setting, uh, and an increasing acceptance of what was a vision in the 2008 constitution of a what they called, you know, in the end came to call a federal state, but was uh, federalism only in name. In reality, it was a, a much more limited set of decentralization and one that was undermining basically what ethnic minority groups had been fighting for 60 years for, but they were coming to accept. So just on the side and a parenthesis, my big take is that the, the coup of 2021 had nothing to do with ethnic minority issues. In fact, had they continued, they probably would have been way ahead. Um, the coup helped ethnic minorities regain their ethnic armed organization, regain their legitimacy and their and their um, uh, objective. So uh, that certainly backfired from the military's perspective from that from that side. So I will come back to this uh, at the end. But I mean, in some ways, uh, what's important to think about here in terms of some 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 key points is that if there was an emergence of a new uh, uh, environment of negotiation, it's important to keep in mind some of these lessons of that decade, that that decade was one that, uh, in many ways, the framework of negotiations, the framework of transition uh, was actually not very conducive to reaching deeper forms of representation for uh, ethnic minorities. And that, that, in some ways, became a dangerous kind of, um, <clears throat> uh, of situation. So, OK, switching to uh, regional comparisons, uh, and I'm going to see, say uh, not too much because I can see that the time is, is flying by very quickly. But I still think I want to flag for you uh, some of the lessons from uh, successful cases of transition, much less complex, much less complex uh, civil wars in the case of Achenese and Moros, Achenese in Indonesia and Moros in the Philippines. Uh, in part because there's not this dynamic of having multiple armed groups representing multiple different ethnic groups with very different interests. So in some ways, uh, Myanmar, just the bar of reaching a settlement is very, very high uh, and, and difficult because simply of that complexity of multiple groups. But even in these cases, uh, which one could think are it's a much more simple, simple uh, kind of, um, uh, of, of civil wars where you have one group against uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the central state. In both cases, there were uh, a lot of difficult um, steps before they could reach the kind of agreements that they have today. And, and some of this, I think, is imp important and useful to think about in the context of uh, a transition in Myanmar. So I'm going to say just a little bit about these two cases, one of which, so these two cases in Aceh uh, had a, a civil war that was on and off, a uh, period that intensified 2001, and they had uh, a law on Aceh in 2006, which really was an elaborate law that, in, that, uh, that institutionalized the end of the civil war, transitioned towards a highly autonomous government uh, for Aceh. The Moros uh, had a, on and off, again, uh, more the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and its predecessor, the Moro National Liberation Front, had civil war in the Philippines for several decades, uh, again on and off in terms of intensity. And in 2018, the Bangsamoro Organic Law uh, was passed, and there is currently a transition. So this is not over. There's currently a transition of moving away from an armed group to being a transitional authority and potentially a government in a new Bangsamoro autonomous region. 
So in Aceh, uh, after 1998, which started the democratic regimes, uh, the democratic regime uh, in uh, in um, uh, in Indonesia, you had a dramatic rise in civil war, and it was followed then uh, by the 2006 peace agreement uh, that uh, and the law on Aceh, which has been peaceful since. And in the case of the Moros. Uh, the longest, it's the longest democracy in Southeast Asia and the Philippines, except for the Marcos regime, but generally low quality and to some extent deterioration under Duterte and it's the devils that you know, you know, we're still waiting to see in the current context. So no, just giving you a very, very brief outlook, there, have been, there was a 1996 agreement with the Moral National Liberation Front, which ended up failing. Many attempts to reach a settlement right up until 2018. Uh, it was a difficult process, despite the fact there was uh, negotiations and a democratic government for most of this uh, this period. So democracy in both cases, if we want to make a crude generalization here, but some of the lessons that I took out of uh, some of, of my book was that it did reduce the ability of the states to sustain uh, repressive policies, make for more difficult justification for groups to mobilize violently over the long term. So this is the way in which the democratic period helps to inform uh, this kind of um, uh, period, uh, opened up opportunities for negotiation and state concessions, and created, again, a credible environment for representation. But here are the issues that I wanted to flag more generally, is that despite the fact that they had a, a, a much better environment in some ways to reach these agreements, uh, there was a lot of difficulty in finding the right legal mechanism, the process by which these would be adopted, and then uh, the uh, post-legislative process, which is how these agreements are implemented. In, in the, both of these cases, you have different phases in which, uh, even though the Constitution had a high agreement, the, the Constitution already recognized forms of autonomy, so hence, thinking about the federal democracy that the ethnic minority groups want to have in Myanmar, uh, most of the work ended up coming afterwards. In terms of the legislation that was put into place, it was, it was the, the very difficult to come to uh, really giving significant powers to Aceh and to the Moros. So a lot of uh, what is not being envisioned yet in Myanmar is that it's not just of having a draft constitution that is going to be key, the real, it, it's being ready for what is going to be the more difficult period, which is it, having the next steps, which is really uh, empowering uh, through legislation many of the details that the constitution might imply. And if anything, the cases of Indonesia and the Philippines are sh show that it can be a very uh, tricky uh, process to be successful. Okay, I'm going to skip some of what, uh, much of the rest of what I had to say because I'm seeing that we're, I would like to leave some time for questions. I'm going to summarize what I was trying to, to say here is that you know, if we have, if we compare and contrast the two, uh, we, we really have very extensive details uh, about um, what is to be uh, in terms of, of, of autonomy, the kinds of principles that are involved, but also very, you know, fiscal formulas, much, much, the boring detail of what goes into this kind of legislation ended up being really, really key in many ways. Um, and when I, when I look at uh, some of the arguments that I uh, have in this book on democracy and nationalism in Southeast Asia, uh, I trace what are some of the reasons why they were able to obtain the kinds of concessions they did. Uh, and it had a lot to do with things such as mobilization capacity, uh, electoral coalitions supporting uh, particular outcomes, and then uh, in terms of credible commitments, whether democracy mm -hmm. helps uh, to uh, reach these kinds of settlements. Like I said, it, it does, but only when institutions uh, are, are closed in terms of their ability to evade commitments. So the problem with uh, in the Civil War literature, there's a lot that's said about um, external monitors uh, as, as enforcers of peace agreement. This is something Myanmar is unlikely to be doing, and in many cases here, including in, South, in Aceh and the Moros, they play very minimal role. So they then rely on democratic institutions to be providing those kinds of 
uh, of um, uh, credible commitment guarantees. Uh, however, the only way this can be done is that the, the, the peace agreements that are agreed to become uh, very difficult to change and, and are reflected in the legislation that comes up. And some of the issues that happen in the Philippines and in Indonesia were that those peace agreements would start getting diluted when they got into the legislative process, when they got into Congress. Uh, and, and this uh, would, create, would undermine and create significant problems for uh, uh, moving forward. And then backfired and return to war uh, would be the consequence. So those are the kinds of issues that I think Myanmar has not yet been thinking about what would happen in an NUGE uh, ethnic arm organization uh, sort of victory is that we're looking at a, uh, a situation where uh, if you open up to a democratic framework, they have a lot more complexity at work, which is giving back representation to ethnic political parties, to civil society organizations. What is the framework in which they can guarantee that an agreement is going to be enforceable? Uh, and that was the problems with those uh, 10 years. So multiple armed groups uh, put pressure, but then the multiple armed groups don't agree with one another about uh, how to move forward. State concessions and transitional stages, uh, there is this kind of federal democracy principle, which was seen as a big concession, but it's very minimal. It's on a very conceptual level uh, when it comes to uh, the real issues, those issues need to be negotiated and going to be difficult. And then electoral coalitions to support this is very key. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the future future of, of such a coalition is not clear. Not clear if there would be elections where ethnic political parties would play a role, or there would be a, a resumption of a National League for Democracy majority, a large party that would be all-encompassing, but that lives with the problems of the last decade, which was there was a, a lot of, they reflected a lot of mistrust of the dominance of the majority group, the, the, the BAMA. So this could be particularly tricky uh, as, a, as a mechanism that can help to enforce uh, a transition towards uh, a, uh, an agreement that would work. Uh, and then, so the problem with the how democracy can provide this critical commitment is that the past suggests that so far the capacity of the state to evade is very, very high. And that is the story of that, that, that last 10 years, is that the Myanmar state had all sorts of ways that it simply evaded the kinds of agreements that uh, it was uh, trying to, you know, in, in the negotiations and in the ways in which uh, governance was occurring, there were many ways in which they were evading, uh, giving more to uh, ethnic states. And so that can be quite uh, difficult. So the challenges then are making commitments that are high, that are credible in light of this past mistrust. And that right now there's a lot of enthusiasm about the, um, the, the, the single-minded objective of removing the military from power. Uh, but that's not enough to base this kind of trust. There's a lot of work happening in the NUG, the National Unity Government, and some of the discussions occurring to try to move past this mistrust, but that mistrust is still there and it remains high. So that's going to be really a, a really very difficult one to reimpose this cred the credibility of commitment. Uh, rec the record of negotiations suggests a deep ship is required. Um, and even though the principles of federalism are there, other cases suggest that the details of implementation are going to be key. So I want to come back to this and say, this is the one, the scenario that I've been, uh, the, the previous scenario that I've been looking at. But what is emerging now as a potential scenario is this one instead. And we have to know that this might be uh, the future uh, as well, is that uh, this is still the possibility, is that ethnic arm organizations are not clear uh, in their support of the democratic process and the democratic forces. They're playing two games. Uh, and some of them are clearly much more likely to prefer this outcome. And I know there's going to be a question on China. China would probably like to see this outcome as well. Uh, and that creates new layers of problems because the ethnic arm organizations are thinking as well of their lessons of the 10 years. And they know that it's much easier for them to reach their own organizational objectives. And also in some ways, they might be their objective might be to control territory. That's the main, main uh, objective. And the army is trying to create that for them as a way of brokering a deal 
uh, that might actually seal uh, an understanding with ethnic armed organizations that they can control some of the territory. And there's precedent. There's the Was state in Myanmar, uh, and many organizations are looking at the Was state as their ideal. It's a de facto independent state, uh, in some ways controls its territory. Uh, and the fear is that some of the uh, insurgency or, or, or increase in, in, in mobilization in the last few months, and the ceasefire was it yesterday, two days ago, uh, is an indicator that this could be step number one in this kind of agreement, uh, which is a ceasefire in the northern uh, Shan state uh, with, the, uh, with the military. So I wanted to leave you uh, with that um, as a thought. Um, so and conclude that Myanmar's current phase shows potential for a different beginning. And I don't want to be too negative here. There is a potential here. Uh, the evidence so far does show that there is a lot of enthusiasm for the, the, the alliance. But my, when I, my point was that the alliance is, is fragile. Uh, and if they do and do emerge as victorious, uh, I think it's useful to think about some of the lessons of the last decade and in comparison to other mm -hmm. civil wars in the region to think about the, how the, some of this can inform uh, a, a very complex environment that's likely to emerge. So, okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, that was really fantastic. Thanks so much. We have excuse me, about 15 minutes for, for questions, so feel free in the room. Um, if folks are online, the chat is open, and I'll keep a, an eye on it, so you could feel free to chat in questions, too. Um, and uh, we will uh, take a look at those in just a minute. Maybe we can start in the room. And introduce yourself also, as, as you guys are well, thank you for the really insightful presentation. My name is Tristan. I'm actually an assistant researcher with Dr. Buckley here for the Center for Asian, Asian Democracy. So really glad to have speakers like yourself come and enlighten all of us. Like you said, I don't think there's a lot of familiarity with Myanmar, but um, this presentation alone seems to be a really fascinating case. Uh, I've got two questions. First, regarding the makeup of the EAOs, are they exclusively paramilitary in nature, or are there any sort of like civil service provisions that they provide to these within their ethnic states? you know, say, and then second, what's the status of Aung San Suu Kyi today? I know she was under some sort of house arrest most recently. Is there any prospects for her being released? Or, you know, is she probably going to be stuck in some sort of, you know, facility for the rest of her life? And in that case, does she have proxy to work on her behalf? What's sort of the state of that democratic reform movement within the country? Okay, good questions. Uh, so two ways of approaching the, the the structure of ethnic armed organizations. I mean, the easy one is to say, uh, and I can't count how many there are, there's at least over 20, 25. The point is that they're, they're very different in scale. They're very different in numbers of soldiers. They're very different in terms of their, their access to arms. They're very different in terms of some have um, control over things such as jade mines. They're very rich. Others have absolutely no uh, financial resources. Uh, they are so it, they span quite a variety of types of ethnic arm organizations. Um, those are the ethnic, right? That is aside, but the SR Douglas story. Uh, that's one way of seeing it. The second way, what, it, what they do share, uh, and is different from arm organizations in Latin America and Africa and many others that we study comparatively, is that they all, uh, or almost all, find their basis of legitimacy or their claim to legitimacy as representing a particular ethnic group, right? And so to them, it's key that they somehow, whether they have the resources or not, they attempt to, um, to organize a civilian structure of some sort. Um, now, it varies in terms of their ability because of those resources and in terms of the, just the history of those organization. Some are actually, the current national union is actually a relatively democratic, uh, not the armed side, but they have a, a civilian organizations that, that is quite uh, democratic. And then at the other end, you get the, uh, the RCSS, which is basically uh, dominated by one person, both the civilian and the, and the military <clears throat> side, but still attempting to create things such as schools and providing help and some, some, uh, some, some resources. One of the things that um, my team and I are studying right now is essentially those kinds of considerations when do they change their discourse as well as civilians? Because some of them really mistreated civilians severely in the past. They all attempted now to brush up their 
their relations to civilians change it, try to provide services and organization, but it's it's quite varied from, from one place to another. Aung San Suu Kyi is in her 80s. She's under house arrest. If she, uh, there's no, I mean, unless the the civil war ends and the military co collapses, she's going to stay where she is right now. Uh, and there's not a whole lot of international support, nor even within uh, ethnic armed organizations that are now the strongest element of the opposition. They feel that Aung San Suu Kyi was not one of their allies, so they're not pushing very hard for a post um, for for her uh, in specifically. Which, and she was the person, you know, the, the, the person leading the National League for Democracy. Uh, number two, number three, were already less influential. The National Unity Government is recreating some of the you know, alternative leadership uh, in among the Bama constituency, but again, there's there's a bit of a division as to whether they want to retain her legacy and her party or try to move beyond. And there's a bit of a tension there. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you for this uh, wonderful and, and very insightful and informative talk. I, I learned a lot. Um, this is a, just a follow up on Tristan. To follow up on Tristan's question, one of the things that I sort of kept mulling over, and um, again, I'm far from uh, knowledgeable in this in this particular region. But I'm wondering, you know, you uh, you pointed out that there's um, extraordinary heterogeneity in these armed groups in terms of, you know, what kinds of resources they command, what kinds of territories and economies and, you know, local kinds of social networks they are um, sort of uh, making bids to represent. And I guess, I, and you point out, I was really struck by what you just said about how what they have in common is that they're all sort of articulating their claim to legitimacy in this kind of language of ethnicity and ethnic representation. And I'm wondering if, if, like, if you could historicize this particular idiom or, you know, when, why ethnicity? You know, if there is such an extraordinary heterogeneity of sort of territories and claims and economies, why does, and since when, has that has it changed, ethnicity becomes the kind of currency of um, effective or legitimate claims making in this particular region, and does it is it different across the different uh, countries or cases that you're looking at, or like does it kind of come in and out of focus? Is it like sometimes religion, sometimes ethnicity, sometimes language, sometimes you know like why ethnicity? I love this question. The problem is my answer takes an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I got so let me give you the the fifteen second answer. Um, Oh, and then I'll do the cop out, you know, go and refer to my book yeah, and then yeah, 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 read chapter seven. seven. <laughs> but I mean part of the part of the issue with uh, and this this is why I you know I come back to history in yeah. this presentation yeah. uh, and the lessons of those ten years is that um, Burma or Myanmar is a very peculiar case in Southeast Asia actually. For some of it for colonial reasons. Uh, but some of it also simply the way in which, you know, the geography of the place and, and, and the types of, uh, of, of, of mm -hmm. um, yeah. so anyway, the point is that it goes way back to, um, to the, 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 the formation of the post-independent state, right? So the, the nationalism of Aung San, the nationalism of, of, of the Burma, Burmese nationalist movement was not a nationalism that was all encompassing in the way that Indonesian nationalism mm -hmm. was, or even Filipino nationalism in the way one can think about. Mm -hmm. it, it ended up being a, uh, a nationalism was mainly a, 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 you know, a, a, an anti-colonial movement to liberate Obama. The ethnic organizations were administered separately. They came late. This Pang Long um, mm -hmm. conference ethnicized the dynamics because that was recognition that they would have ethnic states. Now it became problematic because some had it, some didn't, um, and that became the basis of claims to get their own ethnic state. Once that was put into place and they organized militarily around ethnicity, ethnicity becomes the currency. Now, the military is playing a long game, and what they've done in the 2008 constitution was they made it even more complicated. They gave groups all sorts of rights and rights to carve out new autonomous spaces mm -hmm. if they had certain concentration of a sub-ethnic group. So they go with, <laughs> they have 135 nationalities. Yeah. Yeah. These ethnic states I'm talking about are actually umbrella groups 
and then some within those umbrella groups are groups that can start making some claims for autonomous regions. This became some of the dynamic as well in those 10 years. So, so that's my shortest answer. There's so much more to say, but the point is that it, it's a path dependent yeah. story. It gets to the point where although one wants to give representation and, mm -hmm. and the unitary model really never worked, going all the way to acknowledging ethnicity down to its details and to every single small group that wants oh, to be right. recognized is fragments and makes it impossible. So right. they're stuck with those two. And yeah, that's, that's going to be a compromise. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. There are some groups that yeah. were formed more recently that it, they realize if they have their arm organization, yeah. that gives them a, a, you know, a way of negotiating yeah. on the basis of ethnicity. That's the other level. So it's a complex yeah. place. So, so no, the rest of Southeast Asia, it's different. Right? Yeah. For, that's the, the rest of the. 40 minutes stuff to give you. <laughs> I was wondering, this might relate to the previous question. What was the commitment device for the war state to maintain its federal structure successfully in this uh, northern Africa? It had arms coming in from China. It organized a, um, a it was able to, it, 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 is, uh, it, it has the capacity to produce some arms. It supplies arms to other organizations. It sells them. It had, it, it came out of the, uh, uh, the, it, it came out of the, the, the um, old struggles of communist organizations that transitioned in the north of, of, of Myanmar into ethnic armed organizations, and then it had its hands on the on drug trade, and, and, and so it had resources, had the capacity, it had relations to China as a supporter, and therefore it's only because of strength the military just simply decided to broker to ignore them let them have their stake. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And th that's why that's dangerous because you're now seeing a group like the Arakan army, which is relatively new. They're now seizing control over a good part of Rakhine state. They're being supplied by the law. They have, are, they are now growing into one of the largest armies. Um, and don't quote me on this. I'm online, but <laughs> they, uh, I'm not sure that they are sold to the idea of federal democracy. So I was going to ask the follow-up question: What is the safeguard if, say, uh, there's a commitment device enshrined in the constitution and through legislations, and it both that they, those commitment devices won't be overturned, say, in a democratic context, a Burmese majority government comes into power? See, there's I mean, through amendment, yeah, sorry, and, it's overturning of legislation. So there's. So it's, the, the Bama are 60% of the population, so they will always be a majority. Um, so the, and, and this has been part of the problem, even in the agreements on the electoral system, uh, it, it was a bit of a, of an, you know, many, many people wondered why they chose the kind of electoral system they did, because it didn't necessarily give more representation to ethnic minorities. Um, the difference as well, which was difficult uh, in one of the lessons of, uh, of the 10 years, was that the National League for Democracy in Aung San Suu Kyi had a lot of support in ethnic states. So when she was reelected in 2020, uh, she ended up uh, basically uh, winning over most ethnic states except Rakhine and, and some parts of Shan. So ethnic, ethnic minorities did not vote for ethnic parties. They voted for the National League for Democracy in the hopes that that could give and then they did as well in 2015, by the way. So, so you know, and that's something that they need to be talking about as well, is that, yes, ethnicity is a currency. On the other hand, the evidence is also showing that when comes a time to vote, there's a bit more um, of a possible trade-off here. It's not necessarily ethnicizing. Maybe if the NLD had been more attentive to ethnic minority issues, it actually would have been able to sustain you know, a, a party that crosses ethnic lines and, and that creates the kinds of alliances that they're looking for now, right, which is more difficult now. Now, it's easy to say we were creating new alliances, but once in, the problem is the NLD did this in 1990. They had alliances with ethnic parties when they were in opposition. The lesson learned is that once in power, they no longer were creating the same kind of alliances. So now the fear is the NUG is sounding good, but it has no power. Mm -hmm. If it goes into power again, what will they do? So this is the long-standing mistrust. I don't know who said first. 
on our youth. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the military's role in the economy. Um, like it seems to me when you were talking about a scenario where the military was gone, I'm just not sure how that, I mean, can you talk about how yeah. that might happen and what that, what would happen, what that would look like? <clears throat> so one of the reasons why the military uh, did um, experiment with that 10 years of, of semi-democracy was in part because of the pressure they were feeling from economic sanctions internationally. However, the reality is that China, Thailand, they still had um, all sorts of economic relations with China and Thailand and were bypassing some of the some of these uh, uh, economic sanctions. But they did realize that foreign investment would come in, and it did. M much of that foreign investment was trying to create alternative economic bases, but um, the, 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 the military owns a lot of land, a lot of land, uh, owns a lot of businesses. A lot of the conglom conglomerates in Myanmar had a military component to it. So, so money coming in, even during that period, inevitably was also funding some of the military's intro economic interests, right? Mm -hmm. So that a lot of that has disappeared since 2021. Not only foreign investment has gone out, but a lot of their economic, their, their, their being now, the economy is, is, is declining rapidly. So a lot of their interests has, have, have come down, but they still have their basics, which is they hold many of the main, uh, I mean, they remain the, a stronghold. So mm -hmm. removing all of that from the military, uh, you know, the experience of Latin America is that mm -hmm. the compromise made in Latin American democratization in the eighties was don't touch the military too, too hard. Otherwise, and, and when they did, you would get um, react, gen, you know, reactions. Uh, here, we're looking at a much more entrenched economically and politically uh, military. So no matter what the scenario has to be, that they will have a compromise. I don't think there's any any of the resistance that is ready to even entertain that scenario. So that was one of the points I skipped for that reason, because that's one that adds to the complexity of what I just said um, in a very serious way. <laughs> yes. That was basically my question. Yeah. The economic impact uh, since over the last two years, especially uh, with the uh, military on its back foot now, at least that's what the press says. Uh, what's the possibility of, of, their, of uh, the military doing basic governance, building schools and roads <clears throat> and maintaining things? Is the economic progress that was made over the course of the last 10 years, uh, has that all stopped? And, and what's the quality of life? Well, let's say in the Vermont majority area. Yeah, well, I was just reading something saying <laughs> Yangon seems normal right now. I'm having trouble to, to you know, the economic um, state of Yangon seems okay. So I guess some of the economic activity around Yangon seems to have been uh, resumed. But the reality is that there's, yeah, I don't know. I can't remember if it's 20, 25 percent of the economy. You know, they've, they've declined to the 20, 25 percent in terms of size. So, I think it's a bit of an artificial economy happening a bit around about Yangon. But more specifically, to your point about the military and governance, is the lesson uh, historically is that the military didn't provide much to its population. This was a survival economy right up until 20, 2011. I think most Burmese would agree with that. Yeah, schools were big sort of ran, not very much. I mean, there's, it wasn't the military that was, uh, and, and, and bureaucracies were minimal uh, in, in, in Myanmar right up until 2011, that most of the development that occurred between 2011 and 2021 were um, highly motivated, well-intentioned, newly uh, trained or brought back from the diaspora, bureaucrats, working very closely with international donors uh, and international INGOs. That's where most of the inroads came uh, until pretty much late. I mean, maybe by you know the last few years of the NLD government, we see a little more uh, of building of capacity. Uh, so since the military never really did provide very much, I, you know, I don't envision that they're, that's their priority. Right? Then they're certainly not providing a lot right now. So no, I mean, that's, to them, returning the for, for, I think for most Burmese, this is, this is shared between ethnic minority groups and, and Bama majority is that the, those who remember 
they know it was a survival escape, right? And the economics of survival and the escape as much as they were concerned you know, if it could be as far as possible, <laughs> like they were moving for. Yes. I'm just curious about the, all the Rohingya students. Are they still free in the country because the escape is easy? So the, the, the only good news about the Rohingya is that the, the NUG government has really um, so it's brought in a Rohingya as one of their ministers and has been very um, trying very hard to be inclusive and to and to um, try to uh, well I mean I think I think in the in the resistance the opposition there's a much more inclusive discourse of Rohingya but the reality on the ground is that they they're continuing to they're, they're not returning uh, and those who are there are still living in very enclosed areas. I mean, that's not, they're not being targeted at the moment, but they're, you know, they're not, they're not getting their lands back. Nobody's building any villages for them. They're just stuck as internal refugees. And I don't know what the outflow is if they're still able to leave, but I suspect that uh, some are probably trying. All right. Well, let's uh, join and thank one more time. Uh, <laughs> You all for being here. I have to say, not only for being here, but also for uh, for reading the syllabus and doing the assignment, um, because uh, that was a really exciting attempt to bring specific research from Myanmar and your broader research in the region into conversation with what's going on there today, which is exactly what uh, what got such. <laughs>